Hello everyone, this is Anuradha Sharma and you are watching my channel Eyes with Anuradha. Section 1 You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Section 1 You will hear a woman talking to a builder who is going to do some building work at her house. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Morning. Thanks for coming round. I'm Sally. Morning. Um, so just before we get started, I'll just make a few notes. So um, we're at 15 Hill Street. Yes, that's right. OK, great. And then I need to write down your contact information, just for the office, you know. So first, what's your surname, please, Sally? It's Keyworth. I'll spell that. K-E-Y-W-O-R-T-H. And your phone number. I've got that somewhere. Yes, 027-584-6613. That's right. OK, Sally, so what building work would you like to have done? Well, let's go into the kitchen first. So, you see, it's quite dark in here. We've tried having a few lights fitted, but it hasn't really made any difference. So what we've decided is the window is too small. We'd like a larger one. That shouldn't be a problem. And is there anything else you'd like done in the kitchen? Well, at this time of year, I mean, I shouldn't complain, really. But I wish it wasn't so hot in here. Is there anything you can do about that? Air conditioning? It's too expensive. How about a fan, then? Yes. That would be perfect. Ah, oh, righto. Uh, and what's next, Sally? Well, if we walk through into the bathroom, the thing is, when my father's staying, he can't use the bath. So I thought here, on the back wall, I'd like you to fit a shower. Is that possible? Shouldn't be too hard. I'll get you some brochures, because there are a few ways of doing that. Thanks. Now, those tiles on the wall look new, so do you want to keep those? Yes, the tiles are new, but actually my husband doesn't like them. We want to change to those very small ones, but do I have to choose a colour now? You can do that later. I'll get some charts for you to look at. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now the last thing, let's walk outside. I need to show you some things outside the house. Righto. Oh, nice garden. And the fence looks in good condition. Yes, it's new, but the thing is the gate. It's too low. You have to bend down to open it. We need something that's higher. Right, I'll see to that. Then the other thing is the garage here. We had a break-in, actually. Ah, uh, yeah, I can see. Um, the door should be fine, but the lock. I'll replace that, shall I? Yes, thanks. Then, also, if you step back here and look up on the roof, you can see that it's damaged. Did that happen in the storm a couple of weeks ago? Yes, that's right. I'll get up there and take a look at that, then. 
That might be quite a big job, but I'll get back to you once I've had a look. OK. I can see that your rain gutter is broken as well. Can you fix that? Well, I'll need to replace it, maybe with a steel one. It'd be stronger. No, plastic will be fine, thanks. It's cheaper. OK. And that's everything, I think. Is there any other information you need? What about a start date? Well, I'm completely booked all April, and I've got a job on May the 5th. That'll be a few days, so let's say May the 8th. OK. Now, what about a key in case you're out? We have a security code. I'll give you that. It's a mix of letters and numbers. The code is AG4176. Got that. OK, we'll organise some... That is the end of Part 1. You now have one minute to check your answers to Part 1. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear part of a lecture on organic farming. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now, listen carefully and answer questions. Hi everyone. What I'm going to talk about today is organic farming. Let's first look at what organic farming is. It can be defined as one or more systems of production which don't use synthetic fertilisers, man-made pesticides, herbicides, antibiotics or livestock feed additives to grow crops and raise animals. Virtually all organic farmers prefer to use renewable resources and recycling to give what conventional farmers might consider waste back to the soil of Mother Nature. From this, we can see organic farming is a sustainable production system, which is one of its advantages. Organic farmers use numerous techniques to promote the quality of life of plants and animals within existing ecosystems and minimise pollution that occurs with all conventional farming practices. Another benefit is that, with the increasing consumer demand for a healthier, more nutritionally balanced product, the sales of organically produced food are promoted. According to the research, it has become the fastest growing sector of agriculture and has shown an annual increase of at least 20% during the last six years. What's more, both chemical fertilisers and synthetic pesticides consume non-renewable resources such as oil and coal but the development of organic farming can lower the demand for these fertilisers and pesticides, so it is conducive to the conservation of essential energy. At the same time, it also can reduce industrial pollution caused by the production of these chemical substances. Organic farming differs greatly from the traditional one in a number of ways. Let's discuss it from the perspective of agricultural biodiversity, firstly. For instance, earthworms are an important indicator of soil fertility. Studies have shown that the density and species number of earthworms in organically managed soils are three times as high as those in conventional fields. Moreover, the biodiversity in organic farming can also be reflected in the number of insects, which is twice as many as those in traditional farms. This might be highly related to the fact that organic vegetables are grown without any human-made pesticides, making these vegetables more likely to be damaged. The other main difference between organic and traditional farming lies in crop yields, one of the biggest concerns of organic farmers. Organic farms, though possibly well adapted for certain local environments, produce less food per unit of land. 
For example, organic vegetables like tomatoes and potatoes yielded are 40% less than conventional ones. In addition, research has also found the number of weeds produced in winter is about 90% at present, which has decreased by 10% than before. However, lower crop yields in organic farming are still inevitable at the moment. Anyway, organic farming is a new direction for agricultural development. These days, a variety of organic products are cultivated not only for humans but also for animals. For example, organic grass. It is commonly used in organic farms to feed cows. Because of the non-use of synthetic fertilizers or pesticides, it can protect cows from diseases brought by large-scale breeding, thus ensuring the quality of raw milk. But an interesting phenomenon is that its production has remained constant these years, which is quite unique compared with other types of crops. Research on organic farming has covered various aspects and involved many countries. According to one study, organic farming was proposed in India in the early 1960s when it was faced with acute shortages of food grains due to the ever-increasing population and natural disasters. Although it could not be applied successfully at first, as farmers had been familiar with conventional instructions, proponents of organic farming claimed that organic agriculture emphasized biodiversity and effective soil management could enhance the capacity to mitigate and even reverse the effects of climate change. So, India needed organic farming along with modern scientific agriculture. The study shows that in 2016, India became the country with the largest number of organic products and the production of crops kept growing year on year. Another international review about organic farming presents in the first part that people today have become increasingly interested in organic food. And this opinion is quite the same as that of other articles. But what impressed me most was the volume of the investigation the author did in different countries. He conducted a survey in 99 countries of which 66 are convinced that organic farming is beneficial to animals, while 8 hold the opposite opinion and the remaining 25 say it is inconclusive. Therefore, the last part of the review is mainly talking about whether organic farming brings positive effects to animals. We can see there are different views about the advantages of organic farming. Some may think it can provide more nutritious and healthier food, Others may say it can protect the natural environment and benefit wildlife. However, as far as I'm concerned, it's you, the ones who buy organic products, that will decide what they can bring to you, because market demand determines everything. OK, that's all I want to say. Now, let's open it up for discussion. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear part of a lecture on learner persistence. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now, listen carefully and answer questions. Today, I'm going to talk about my research on learner persistence. Let me first introduce why I wanted to carry out such research. As a university teacher, I found learners' responses to certain things vary a lot. For example, some students may completely give up their degree studies because of a temporary illness, while others may overcome all kinds of difficulties 
and try their best to continue their studies. The latter are the students with learner persistence, and this is the group that I'm particularly interested in. To do the research, first I selected my undergraduate students as the research sample, with a total of 200 people. All the students selected were seniors, and they had already stayed in the course very well. Although the sample was drawn from a range of ages, there were deliberately a large number of mature students, and there was one thing in common: all of those students were living at home in the local region. I wanted to maintain this element of consistency, so I didn't include those coming from outside this area. Then I designed a questionnaire that aimed to find out what their concerns had been when they began the course. And then, what had made them stick at the three-year studies in university? Findings from the first section pointed out that there were different concerns when they started their university studies. For example, some worried about the financial circumstances, while others were concerned about their careers after graduation. However, the research found the biggest concern for mature students tended to be the relationship with their children at home. Next, I wanted to find out what had made those students persist with their university studies. So, in the second part, I designed my questionnaire under three main headings: social and environmental factors, other factors, and personal characteristics. And I included three levels of importance for each of these three headings. At the first level, those points identified by the respondents were regarded as the most important in learner persistence. Let's look at them one by one. For the first column, that's the social and environmental factors. A significant number of students said it was crucial to have effective support, whether from their tutors or friends. For other factors, students were driven not so much by high grades, but by what they regarded as a success in their studies. This was quite different from what I'd expected. Regarding personal characteristics. A sizable percentage of participants said they liked to take up a challenge, which was seen as a very important factor. Then, at the second level of importance in the first category, many of the respondents regarded the life they enjoyed at school as an important social factor because this gave them good experiences. In the second column, other factors. A lot of people said that the most significant thing was decent health, which was also conducive to their persistence in the studies. And then, under the third column, quite a number of respondents had the same view that they should have a range of interests in their everyday lives because this could broaden their minds and give them a sense of perspective, which less persistent learners might lack. And then, onto the third level of importance, under social factors. Several respondents said that they had been keeping close to their tutors in their three-year university studies. In the second column, for other factors, they mentioned it was very important to live in a family without any problems. And finally, under column three, they talked about the capacity for multitasking, which was the ability to simultaneously deal with different problems. From these findings. I've concluded some recommendations on how to promote students' learner persistence. Primarily, I suggest that we should distribute questionnaires to the freshmen so as to make clear of their maturity when they begin the course. This is really our most important concern. Secondly, I propose that we should find ways to offer some training sessions to the students who are selected to encourage them to play the role of advisers. The purpose of this is to make support much more approachable to other students. Thirdly, in the evening and night when offices are closed, students may have no one to turn to for help. As a result, I think we should provide online services to those in need. Researchers have pointed out that this service is actually more accessible than traditional services. And finally, if students don't submit their assignments before the deadlines. I think we teachers should contact the students first, rather than waiting for the students to come to us. So this is all I want to share on my research. Now let's turn to the next part. Are there any questions about? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. 
You will hear part of a presentation about the early history of salt. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about salt. In modern times, when we talk about salt, people may associate it with high blood pressure or increased heart risk, and many health experts warn that we should use less salt in our meals and dishes. However, we should not ignore its importance in our cuisine and even in early human history. Salt is one of the oldest, most ubiquitous food seasonings. The taste of salt is one of the basic human tastes. More importantly, salt plays an indispensable role in the health of human beings. For example, it regulates the body's acid-base balance. Because of its importance to survival, salt has often been considered a valuable commodity during human history. This can be tracked all the way back to ancient Greece, ancient Egypt and ancient Rome, when salt was highly valued and used as a method of trade and currency. In ancient Rome, the busiest road leading to the city was the Via Salaria, which means the salt route in English. A soldier's pay, which partly consisted of salt, was known as salarium argentum in Latin, from which we derived the English word salary. A soldier's salary was cut if he was not worth his salt, an expression still used today. In fact, salt was not only the first condiment discovered, but also the first preservative. We know today that food goes bad because microorganisms in the food multiply in abundance, and a high salt environment is not conducive to microbial reproduction. Extremely high concentrations of salt can even kill microorganisms in the food. The ancients certainly didn't know this, but they did know that salted food can be preserved for a long time. The use of salt as a preservative can be traced to ancient Sweden. At first, hunting was the principal means of livelihood. In this case, meat supplies were unlikely to be frequent. What's more, fewer animals were available for hunting. In order to ensure the supply of meat, many families in Sweden began to raise animals in the surrounding forests during the summer, when the weather was suitable for animals to survive. These animals were fed every day until about three to four months later. That's in October. They were ready to be butchered for meat, and that was the only month when ancient Swedish people had fresh meat on their table. Then, with the continuous increase in productivity, people finally had some meat left. However, how to store the meat had become a headache until someone invented a whole new way to preserve food, salting. People tried to keep meat from going bad by adding some salt to it, and it could be preserved for several months and even years. There was evidence that salt was widely used to preserve meat. Historical documents in 1573 recorded the Swedish king's everyday meals mentioning that 175 pounds of meat was consumed each year, but over 150 pounds was salty. From this, we can clearly see the importance of salt in Sweden at that time. In addition, the documents also noted the annual sales of beer in Sweden soared during that period, and this must be related to high levels of salt in their food. Now. Let's turn to the sources of salt. Where is salt from? Well, salt is common in nature. It has long been found that salt can be extracted from seawater, mineral deposits, saline lakes, 
brine, spring, etc., among which the two most important ones are oceans and basins. On the floor of the latter often lie deserts where traces of salt can be found, such as the Sahara. Furthermore, the quality of different salt types varies a lot. For example, salt from seawater is always mixed with impurities. So after the salt is dried, the sediments and other chemicals need to be purified before eating. However, this is not the case with salt from spring water. We can hardly find any impurities, and the salt level is much more concentrated. Then, how did people distribute salt around the world? Of course, in modern times we have various ways of transporting goods, but in ancient times it was not the case. Take ancient Sweden we mentioned before as an example. Because of the heavy use of salt in the diet, Sweden could not feed itself and had to import large amounts of salt from other countries. In order to make sure they could buy enough salt from abroad, the Swedish had to attach great importance to shipping and keep it undamaged, as it was the most crucial way at that time. While in other ancient countries, in order to distribute salt to other places. Groups of men were employed. They put bags of salt on their shoulders or backs and moved them to the surrounding regions. And gradually, these people were considered as a mode of transport in early times. Later, with the improvement of traffic conditions, salt trade between different regions was boosted, and long-distance food trade was also promoted, making communication between different cultures more frequent and. That is the end of part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.